Thank you, Professor Divya, and um, uh, thanks everyone here. Uh, thanks to the ICDE for putting on this really impressive event. Um, we were a little bit worried when we got here this morning and saw the smoke machines going full steam. Um, I did wonder whether, um, whether I was going to need some backing dancers, and I did have Lisa Marie Blaschke and Martin Weller as backups, but uh, we didn't have time for a rehearsal, so it's just me up here for now. Um, thanks to UNISA for hosting us, not just here, uh, but also in Pretoria for the last week, and of course to the wonderful Paul Prinslow, who's been so welcoming, and he's been helping me for the last year and a half we've been corresponding. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, I think a round of applause for Paul. <laughs> um, and uh, and you, I'm glad you picked up on that question mark, um, uh, Professor, Divya, uh, Professor Singh, because I was wondering, because um, uh, I don't want this to be like, oh, here's another new thing, and here's another silver bullet that we've all been looking for. I am actually kind of going to be talking to you today as a practitioner, as a learning designer who is now starting to think of herself as a learner experience designer. And, um, and in fact, this is going to be quite a practical talk um, because um, I think we are dealing uh, with some really wicked problems. Um, as we heard, I mean, we, we heard some of the wicked problems earlier today, just from Laura and from Audrey. Um, uh, yesterday, Professor Makanya spoke about the increasing demand for being entrepreneurial in higher ed, uh, but also the increasing risks that that can bring with it for student success, for technology implementation, for staff development. And, uh, and then there was a real tricky question that came up during the panel session. Uh, saying what is the role of distance and education in a world where content is ubiquitous. And of course that was picked up in the Twitter stream where the conversation continued. Now if you haven't been joining us in the Twitter stream, you've really been missing out on some great conversations. And conferences are always the best place to get started on Twitter, so if you haven't been doing it, do join us over there. Uh, so uh, Professor Andrew Van from CSU in Australia responded in sorts on Twitter and he said, well, if our value isn't content, uh, shouldn't it be social learning and transformation? And, it, and his follow-up question was, well, how do we achieve that? And so my thinking over about the last year to year and a half has been that we can do this, we can start to add value by uh, creating experience, by focusing on creating experience. Um, I think that experience design can help minimize the risk. Uh, I think uh, because it can work in incremental and iterative processes, it fits alongside our learning design practices. So this isn't something that um, is going to do away with the old. It is more adding some methodologies and some tools that to help us achieve the aims that we're aiming for. And, and it comes with these robust methodologies that are quite ready for us to adapt for our purpose. Um, so my experience um, over uh, probably the, the last year and a half, or actually probably a little bit earlier than that, was that I was getting a little bit frustrated with my work as a learning designer. Um, I had been working in corporate training for about eight years, and then when I moved to New Zealand, I, um, I moved into higher education, and I found that really my job wasn't changing very much. It was very much centered around the LMS, um, while at the same time, I was starting to explore these incredibly rich learning spaces uh, online, on Twitter, on Facebook, on, uh, on Pinterest, and all of these different spaces. And I just knew that what we were doing in the LMS, it felt contrived. The discussion forums never felt natural. Uh, it was really difficult to do things that would be simple in other environments. And, and, and it also felt like we were constantly hanging out for that silver bullet. Uh, but, you know, whether it was lecture recording or whether it was web conferencing or whether it was the M word, Laura, uh, it also, it always felt like it, 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 there were these big hypes and they never really lived up to it. And uh, of course, recently there's been a big discussion about this, this word disruption and how everything, you know, how your education is getting disrupted. I loved reading Martin Weller's post uh, on that, saying that, you know, do we really want disruption? Because do you know what that means? And, uh, and of course, we don't. We don't want disruption. At the same time, we all know that we could be doing a lot better. 
And, um, and that's why, um, you know, for me personally, my dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction kind of meant that I started to hang out in other spaces. It also meant that I left the university system um, and, uh, and at one point thought, oh, I'll just go do something completely different. But starting to move into different spaces and starting to move into di other disciplines, uh, business spaces, co-working spaces, startup communities, meant that I started to get exposed to um, user experience design. I was talking to a lot of people who were creating products, creating services, creating new businesses. And as I find out more about it, I started to reschool myself and actually found that, no, I still had a passion for learning design. I still had a passion for uh, higher education. Um, but now I was finding some new methods and some new tools that I could start to use in order to actually improve what it was that I and the teams that I work with were, were, were co-creating. So I got a renewed energy for e-learning and online learning, or uh, whatever we call it, as Professor Singh said yesterday, and, um, uh, and I think we should just call it learning. It's just learning. And everything I learned about user experience design over the last year and a half has just made a lot of sense, and I could see immediately how I could start to use it in my work. Um, because we're not the only ones who've been struggling with, um, with uh, you know, the pressures of new technologies, the pressures of changing, uh, cha of our changing users, of our changing audiences. Um, this is a, a, um, a pyramid that comes from uh, uh, the customer experience design or service design. And uh, when I stumbled upon this, I thought, oh my God, this fits so well with what it is that we're doing. Uh, because what it talks about is it, it talks about this idea that we increasingly move up the pyramid and that we start with our systems and with the tools that we have in place where they are quite functional and very focused on the tasks. And then, you know, you move up a little bit, it becomes more reliable, um, usable. And, and there comes a real turnaround point about halfway up, which is about where it switches over from being usable to actually being convenient. And now we are creating experience. Now we are creating an emotion with the, for the user that we're designing for. And I thought, yes, this makes a lot of sense. And in fact, I don't think that a lot of, um, of the work that we do hits that tip over point. And I really wish that we could hit it more often and more reliably. So what is user experience design? If you go online, you will find a lot of diagrams that look like this. They're incredibly convoluted. <laughs> and in fact, what I've just done is I've given you a bad learner experience. Um, this is a, uh, a map that kind of shows the intersections between all of the different design approaches that go into user experience design. And of course, this is way too difficult to actually process straight away. So for the purposes of today, I thought I would dress it down a little bit and unpack it and start with um, uh, the father of design, Don Norman, uh, and who talks about uh, and I, I selected this quote, the world is complex and so too must be the activities that we perform, but it doesn't mean that we must live in continual frustration. It doesn't mean that we must live in continual frustration. No, the whole point of human-centered design is to tame complexity, to turn what would appear to be a complicated tool into one that fits the task, that is understandable, usable, and enjoyable. User experience design, and I'm just going to unpack a few of these that I think are most relevant to our field. Um, this is from Nielsen, uh, from Jacob Nielsen and Don Norman, is that the first requirement for an exemplary user experience is to meet the exact needs of the customer without fuss or bother. Next comes simplicity and elegance that produce products that are a joy to own and a joy to use. And true user experience goes far beyond giving the customer, they say, but think about it in terms of learners, what they say that they want. Uh, in order to achieve high quality user experience, there must be a seamless merging of the services of multiple disciplines, including engineering, marketing, graphical, and industrial design and interface design. And I think it's that joining of all of those different parts that have to work together in order to create a learner experience that we kind of struggle with. A related uh, discipline would be interaction design. 
which is closely linked to the design of digital control interfaces for products. Uh, but in fact, it goes beyond just digital products. Um, uh, it plays an important role in sibling controls. In fact, today we found out about this clicker. Uh, I tweeted it earlier, and it's just got two buttons, right? Back and next. There is nothing we can do wrong with this clicker. Um, if you want an example of bad interaction design, uh, you've probably all used a remote for a video conference unit. That, that would be an example of bad interaction design. And then there's service design. Service design is the intentional and thoughtful design of internal and customer facing activities needed to deliver a service. Where experience design concerns itself only with the customer facing aspects, so for us that would be our learners, service design actually also looks at the experience of the people who are delivering that service. That would be us, the learning designers, the librarians, the, um, uh, and the lecturers, everyone who's involved in that process, front, front line and back office. And so service design really cares equally about the experiences of all people that are involved in the delivery of a service. What all of these approaches have in common, there are two things that all of these approaches have in common. The first one is empathy for the user. And I think this is a really important thing for us to start to think about. I think we try it, I think we do it all the time, but sometimes we take shortcuts. Sometimes there's just not enough time. I've been reading a wonderful book called Practical Empathy by Indy Young, in which he explains that how she thinks about empathy. And it's basically two, two, two ways. One is that empathy is a noun, it is a thing. It is an understanding that you develop about another person while empathizing is the use of that understanding. It's an action. So empathy is built because you're willing to listen to your learner, it, it, because you take the time to discover the deep down thoughts and the reaction that make that person tick. Um, and, and you want to find out, to understand their cognitive and emotional states. And then empathy gives you the ability to try on that person's perspective. Um, and then you need to develop the empathy before you can actually try to apply it. So in this way, learner analytics are wonderful and they give us lots of information about our learners' actions and what it is that they actually do. But can they give us the insights into their emotional states? They can tell us where the learners click, but they can't tell us why. Um, some of the things that we do in order to find out how our learners are feeling uh, quite often happen too late in the, pro in the learning process um, and, and often are too late, in fact, to inform that learning process. So I'm thinking about student evaluations, for instance. So um, I think we need to kind of see where we can fit in with this idea of empathy when we do learner experience design. Another thing that all of these um, design approaches have in common is that they've got a very standard methodology. Uh, they have their own tools and processes and methodologies that follow on from each other. They don't always all get used, but every single one of these has a toolkit that the designer picks from in order to achieve their aim. They're all about gradually improving experiences for users through iterations and ensuring that even the first iteration can stand on its own as either a product or a server service that delivers an experience. So I started to explore whether there was maybe room for us to do learner experience design and we've been, there's, there's a group of us that are, that are exploring this and, and we've, uh, you, you can search the hashtag, we use the hashtag Lex design to kind of bind our conversations together and, um, and I started to see what we could actually adapt and how, how we could use it. Um, not in a commercial way, but these are tried and true methodologies that can actually help us to do what it is that we've been struggling to do, which is we are trying to deliver extremely rich experiences through very complex products like the LMS, um, like you know, lecture recording, and through very complex services. Um, in order to enroll a student and to finally get them in the classroom takes a whole chain of people that are involved in that service. So we're doing service design, we're doing product design, but all of it not aimed at a commercial aim, but aimed at an experience aim. And, uh, and that, that is not an easy task. So um, 
I thought I'd put this picture in. This is Dr. Jess Knott. She is at the uh, universe, uh, State University of Michigan. Uh, no, I'm not saying that right. Michigan State University, uh, where she is the um, manager for um, uh, the, the learning design team there. And they have started to uh, use uh, Lex Design. And uh, Jess is my main co-conspirator. And I thought I would put this picture up because um, I'm sure she'll be really happy to see it all over Twitter. <laughs> Um, and uh, Jess and I have both been doing, in, with our own teams and with our own projects, we have been working to start to explore how these methodologies can actually work in practice. So I'm going to take you through a few of the, um, of, of, of a few examples of the work that we've been doing. Um, so the first methodology that we started to use is card sorting. If you are, have been involved in systems design, then you're probably very familiar with it, but uh, if you're a learning designer, then you may not have seen this yet, and yet it is a very uh, useful tool in order to do uh, an information architecture. And we use this in order to design a program site for a, uh, a visual arts program. Um, the request that came into the digital learning team was, uh, can you please sort out our blackboard? Can you just sort out our blackboard? That's that's what they wanted, and uh, we said, all right. Well, what do you what do you want? And they said, well, it's just messy, and somebody needs to go in and sort it out. Instead of just straight away going in and doing exactly that, what we said is, well, let's do some user research. Let's do some user research. Let's see what the actual problem is, and we used card sorting in order to do that. So we created a set of cards that had elements of all of the things that were currently on the site. And then we did five card sorting interviews with people, with users. Uh, some of them, about there were three teachers and there were two students that we, uh, that, that we took through the process. And we asked them basically to look at these cards and put them into a logical order, the way that you would like to see them grouped in, your, um, uh, in, in, the, in the program site. And it was just astounding. So the card sorting itself actually failed. But what we did, because they all came away with completely different structures. Um, but what we did at the same time is we asked them to speak out loud as they were doing this. And, uh, and there were two of us in all of the interviews. One of them was a scriber and the other one was facilitating the interaction. And what we found is that what they were saying was so rich. It was so rich and it told us so much about the actual problem that was there. Um, because what they were saying was, I don't even know what this is. Do we do this? What does this mean? Oh, I think we're supposed to do this, but I have no idea where I would put it. it there was just a lot of confusion. Um, one of the other things that we did with people was that we asked them to, after that, actually just sketch out for us on a wireframe what they think the home page should look like for that um, for that program site. And again, we asked them to speak out loud as they were doing it, and they came up with completely different things. They, um, they came up with things that they hadn't been talking about during the card sort at all. Um, they said, oh, I would like this, and I would like it to be much more visual, and we would like it to do this, that, and the other. And um, doing all of this was an incredibly complex um, uh, it was a very laborious task for me and the other uh, uh, learning designer that, that was working with me. Uh, sometimes educational t technologists, we, 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 we kind of retreat from, uh, from all of the information that we can gather in that way and we just do like one chat to somebody or we do one user interview. Uh, but what we did uh, here was actually, uh, we actually recorded everything, we transcribed it, we tried to then go through a bit of a, a coding um, exercise as well. So what we did is we put everything on post-its, we put it all on the window, and then we started to group it. Um, so in total, this whole exercise probably took us about 16 hours, and we were getting jibes from the rest of the team. They were saying, oh my God, there's two of you working on this. It's so much work. Uh, what is the ROI on this? And uh, what we actually found was that there were many, many pain points, but there were three main ones. There was confusion around the terminology. 
there was confusion around the terminology. Some people were using the word courses, some people were using the word specialties, some people were talking about specializations. There was a very, and, and that was just one term, uh, there was just a complete mix up of everything that, that, that was in that site. Uh, there, was, um, uh, there was no agreed digital practice between all of the users. There was, th throughout the program, there was no agreed digital practice about how this resource was going to be used. And the third point was a really big point, which was that the email traffic was through the roof. Nobody was using the site because it didn't have a clear purpose. And, um, and so when it comes back to that ROI thing and the ROI questions that were being asked, we spent probably about 16 hours on this project. Um, but if we can cut back with the redesign, on five hours of email per week per teacher in a 10 full-time equivalent team, then we've saved probably somewhere in the in neighborhood of around 2,500 hours and also a lot of stress. Because every conversation that we have with people, they said, oh, there's so much email, there's so much email. So it actually pays to do some of this work and to do it right. Personas are another very valuable tool in a uh, Lex Designers toolkit. Uh, personas are a type of user model that allows designers to predict how users are going to act and think and why they want to accomplish a certain task. And they aren't based on any specific user. They are actually a composite archetype. So they're, uh, they're, they should, however, when you start to create personas, they should be based on factual data that is discovered during the user research stage. And this is where learning analytics can absolutely come in, uh, but also enrollment information and any kind of demographics information that you can get on previous cohorts so that you can actually design those per personas very carefully. Um, what we found with personas is that you can use them in lots of different stages of the design process, but it really helps to have those archetypes in your head and that you and the entire team who are working on the learning design actually agree on who those people are. It is much easier to say, oh, but Marie wouldn't do this, than uh, say, oh, but you know, our data shows that 30% of students are women. It's, it's a great shorthand for actually working together as a design team. And um, once the persona are established, you can use them in lots of different ways. Uh, I thought that what was really interesting about this particular project, which was for a school of architecture, um, actually they called it a MOOC, but it's not, it's not gonna be massive, so it's actually gonna be an OOC. And um, they, uh, they were going to, um, when we were in the, in the room with all of the lecturers, uh, the most interesting thing was about their discussions about who their students were, because they all had completely different people in mind. So even just getting, every, you know, using these tools as a way of actually having the important conversation, but with an end in mind, has been incredibly useful to us. And then probably one of the most uh, useful tools that I found, it is uh, this thing called learner journey mapping. And uh, we tend to do a little bit of mapping in our course design, um, but, um, but what we were doing before this, and I think what's probably common uh, practice across different uh, institutions, is to use a week by week map. So this is gonna happen in week one, this is gonna happen in week two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't need to be that way. In a way, what you're doing when you do that is you are equating, or you're kind of using that course map uh, the way that you would use PowerPoint bullet points. You know, just because they're already there, we're going to fill them in. Um, instead, um, you can try to work with different kinds of visualizations, and I find that the learner journey map is a really great way of doing it. The way that it works is you would map out a path for a student, and you don't have to do it for an entire course. You can do it for an individual learning object, you can do it for one tutorial, you can do it for many different parts of the, of, of the, of the learning design that you're creating. But you will map a path uh, for the student, and then you will also map paths for all of the different parts of your organization or of your service that are going to interact with that, uh, with that learner. And then what you want to do is you want to draw all of the touch points that are there. The next step is to capture the emotions that are associated with those touch points. 
Um, and you can do that for both the learner and you can do that for the staff that are involved. You know, how easy is this? Um, is, you know, are people happy with the way that this is working or are they unhappy with the way that this is working? And again, you can either do this through surveys, you can do it through uh, user interviews. For this one, we did, uh, we did user interviews uh, with only staff because we didn't have enough time to, to do the students. But once we've mapped this journey and once we've um, uh, addressed some of the pain points that the lecturers had, uh, we can continue to develop this map and the, our next round can actually be, you know, that iterative process of going to the learners and saying, well, you know, how is this working for you? So this was a learner journey map that we developed and I will tweet it later. Um, I wasn't getting an internet connection earlier so it might not be out there. Um, but um, uh, this was a, a learner journey map that had to do with a work placement that students had to do and it was part of a uh, very short turnaround uh, learning design pro project that, that we were working with um, RMIT University on. Uh, they're called VE Express Projects and basically it should be turned around in about four to six weeks. And so the idea was not to address everything about the course but it was to just identify one or two pain points and that's where this came in. Um, and so what we found with this, the way that we went about it is uh, we actually just did a paper map first. So we worked very closely with the graphic designer to create that previous artifact. Um, but, um, but this is what we started with and this is something that you can do, you know, in, in, in any staff room or in any staff development room. Um, uh, and it was just basically saying, all right, what, is, what are all the different players in this process doing and let's map that out. And it took us about two and a half hours initially and then we mapped it all into Excel, into a Google Doc, and shared it with everyone, and, uh, and people were able to fine tune it, go back in and say, oh no, that's not exactly how it works. Uh, but what's interesting is that they, you know, they kind of gained a renewed understanding of all of the different parts that was happening in that process, but also just how laborious it was. And so, um, I've just seen you a, a little bit of a, of a, um, a an indication or just a zoom in a close up so that you can see some of the things that would some of the touch points that we were capturing. So uh, what you can see there is the initial teacher activity for instance to send emails and invites to recruit the industry to participate and then the role of the industry mentor is that they will get the email invite and find out about placement and the channel that's being used at for there is email. And so what we found was that actually that was one of the biggest problems, the fact that they were using so much email um, for, in order to communicate, to find placements for 120 students. Um, there was a, an enormous amount of uh, traffic between the one lecturer who was also teaching that course and trying to find 120 placements for, you know, two-week placements for the, for the visual arts students. And so what we've now decided is that we're actually going to alleviate that. And that will be the end of the four to six week pro uh, project. So uh, we, will, uh, we will set up a WordPress site so that all of the information is there and there won't be this back and forth between the teacher and the industry mentors. Uh, we're going to set up a MailChimp so that it is easier to actually manage that mailing list. And we're also going to set up Typeform uh, so that all of the feedback doesn't have to, ha have to happen uh, via email, but that that can be captured really, really easily as well. So um, again, it's not a complete overhaul. This is something that anyone can do. It's just identifying a pain point and alleviating it. Um, a really nice example of this came across uh, my, my Twitter stream just a little while ago by Mike Wesh. And um, uh, what he had done is he had um, uh, adjusted his syllabus. He decided that the syllabus wasn't really giving the students, getting the students excited. It wasn't really getting the students, giving the students that emotional moment that you want them where they, they find this experience pleasurable. I mean, most syllabus, syllabi um, are, are just, you know, uh, uh, a line of text, one after the other, and then a code at the end of it about what you're going to be doing or that, it, that indicates uh, where it fits into the program. Uh, and so he said, all right, this isn't really giving my students the kind of experience that I want them. And, and, and in order to get excited about this, the students really need a reason and, and, and an emotion. So you need to feel excited. And so he, uh, he created this annotated version, which is really nice. And then he went completely over the top and he also created a video version. Uh, but you know, this, again, this is just an example of a small change that you can easily uh, achieve. Um, one of the interesting things about experiences is that they are co-created. Um, 
they happen when the student comes into the, into the class or into the institution and there's an interaction between the organization and the con consumer, or the, in this case, the learner, that, that that's where we actually find the space of the value creation and also the, the value extraction. So when we're thinking about this um, idea of co-created experiences, we provide one experience, but the student brings another thing to us. And they do that through, sorry, I should have been there. <laughs> and they do that through uh, their own personal learning networks. So they bring their own personal learning networks into, the, uh, to, into our environment, and we need to be ready to actually interact with those and to meet up with those. Um, this is another example of a research uh, personal network, because people are going to have their own personal learning networks. And what we need to do is make sure that our systems are ready to actually have better connections between those so that we can improve the connection between the learner's network, the resources and the system that we have, and our systems. We need to make our systems more porous. So there's a great potential in you know, what used to be known as Tin Can and has now become the Experience API. I'm just going to fast forward to this because I realize that I'm gonna be out of time. But I think that the other important thing that we need to do is we need to design for a constellation of experiences. And uh, this is where I think that the open badges uh, really have a lot of um, potential. Um, there was a lot of talk yesterday about people dropping out or stopping out at the moment of transition. Um, and what is it that we can do in order to actually create an experience by designing, not just for the time that people at our institution, but actually designing knowing that they are going to have a life of learning and that that is going to happen in many different um, in many different spaces. And this is where I think there is a tremendous amount of potential for open badges, uh, because really a certificate is just an offline badge, as Doug Belshaw says. Um, so I think it's time for us to start thinking about this constellation of pathways and how we're going to achieve that. Um, how, how am I doing? Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, in that case, I will just go through to the end. <laughs> I think it is important to say this, that there are many people who have already been working, doing work on this, and um, there is uh, some work being done on Lex Design research as well, but I think there needs to be a lot more work that we do on that, and the only way that to do it is that I would encourage all of you to start thinking of yourself as learner experience designers in the work that you do every day, whether you look after an LMS, whether you manage a team, or whether you're a learning designer yourself.